Good morning. We are so happy to have you here. We are talking about the common questions about the self-determination program. The entire presentation will be in Spanish. If you would like to hear the presentation in English, if you're on your computer, you will find a globe at the bottom of your screen that says interpretation and there you choose English. If you prefer to hear the presentation in Spanish, please pick Spanish. If you do not pick a channel, it's likely you will not hear. You are going to hear a lot of silences. We ask you now to please pick your preferred language. Please pick under the globe that says interpretation, or it could be just a globe. I, I will now switch to the Spanish channel. I'm going to start sharing screen. Here you have today's presentation. Thank you for being here. I hope that everyone is doing great. It's a Saturday morning. We thank you for being here. I am Kelly Colter Reyes. And I am here with Disability Voices United in order to help you with some uh, common questions and some answers, we hope. So that we can be successful with the self-determination program. We have some important uh, announcements. You are able to ask questions throughout the presentation by adding them on the chat, or you can also raise your hand so we can answer your questions. And just so you know, on screen, you're going to see the Spanish, the English in blue and Spanish in orange on the presentation on screen. English will always be on the right of the screen and Spanish will be on the left. Please pick your channel. I think that everybody has done so. If you need to pick a channel for your preferred language. Today, we are offering this presentation in English and Spanish. Another announcement, we are going to have a resource fair for the self-determination program. It will be on June 20. It will be close to you, those of you that are on the Westside Regional Center in their catchment area. It's at the Mem Memorial uh, Building and Teen Center. And you can see the address on screen. And this event is sponsored by the Self-Determination Program Local Advisory Committee from the Westside Regional Center. And this uh, meeting actually is also sponsored by the same committee. Today, we will talk about self-determination. And we must remember that we are using services and support related to the disability of their participant. And we're doing this in order to reach the personal goals that are included in the Persian Center Plan PCP. You can see on screen my daughter, Amelia. And we are going to use her program as an example and also from some friends of ours. 
the goals are the ones who inform the services and support. And the self-determination program gives us the opportunity to control supports and services. But if this is all still based on disability, it's not just things that we want to do in life, but we need to work with the challenges and what we need in order to help the individual's disability. Here you have some example of things that we can do with the self-determination program. We have a little girl here dancing with a folklorico group. And we see a segue with a friend of mine who needs that. In order to be part of the community, And the thing is, in order to buy uh, something like a Segway, you need to have a goal that states that he wants to be part of the community. And because his legs are very short, he needs something in order to move around the community, in order to uh, engage with his family. So these are some community examples. Here you see my daughter on screen. She will participate in her community with activities that she chooses with appropriate support. When we talk about this, we are talking about things that she wants to do, not what I want to do because I am the mother. She is a 10 year old, she has her opinions. She has a life. She has things that she wants to do. But we are doing this so that she can participate in the community. So she can focus in ad on adaptive skills that she needs. And it is important to know what goes with the goals and also what she can use the funds for. So there are things that can be funded with SDP, but there are things that are not. But what she can fund with SDP is, for example, a tutor or a coach for community living. And that's under service code 320. This uh, is community living supports. This uh, type of support can be used for the staff you're hiring to support the people needing the support. This code could be used both at home and in the community. There are music and dance groups. You can uh, create your own group if you don't have one close to you, but you, you're able to do this and you can pay the staff or the class with SDP funds. You can make play dates. And again, the staff that's supporting you can be paid with the SDP funding and materials that you need for the activity but this is very specific. The materials are specifically for the play date. These are some options and possibilities with SDP. In the case of Amelia, what you see in the picture, she is in a cooking class with other families. We paid for that class and the person who taught the class she bought everything that was needed for the class. She is providing everything that we needed. And after that, we were able to invite people, uh, friends from the community and everything was done at home. And I didn't even need to clean up to have it uh, at home. 
that was part of the service to have that be done at home. That was uh, so wonderful for me. We did uh, horseback riding, one-on-one -on -one lessons, and those classes can be paid with SDP funds, self-determination program. And the FMS is the one who paid uh, for that. And FMS is financial management service. This is important because I'm not paying that directly. So the one thing you need to know is that this organization is the one thing that is mandatory. That is the one required service. And it is called FMS in English. Financial Management Services. All the supports much comply with the final HCBS rule. This is HCBS means services based at home and the community. And what this means, it is that it is required that the services be provided in the community in an inclusive way. This means that they are part of the community it does it means that it's not classes or things that are just for people with disabilities it has to be things with the uh, entire community there are ways for you to handle this and decide how you do this and this is very important here you have another example a friend of mine that's using his phone he did he took a class where he learned to use his phone you know, with safety because we really need to be careful with messages, with uh, internet access. There's so many things that gives us, that made us afraid as mothers. So we need to ensure that he's using technology in a safe way. So what we're doing here is that he has staff that helps him with technology, but he has staff that's teaching him to cook both things at the same time. It could be the same person. It could be a community living coach. These are the type of things that can be paid with SDP. Here we have another example that I love. Here we have a friend of mine called Julian. Those are some examples so we can open our minds to the possibilities that we have in self-determination. And the company that made this is called Surf and Turf Therapy. Surf and Turf. Water and land. I think that we can make 
a brief pause to see if we have any questions. I don't know if Kira can help us feel the questions. I don't know how we're going to do this with Spanish. Thank you, Kira. Okay, we have Brenda with her hand up. Brenda, are you able to unmute? Go ahead. What question can we answer for you? I cannot hear her. Are you in the Spanish channel, Brenda? Have you picked your channel, Spanish channel, in the toolbar at the bottom of the screen? Have you picked your channel, in this case, Spanish? Kelly, in, in the chat, um, in the chat, Brenda has said that um, the microphone is not working. Um, so maybe we can have Brenda go ahead and ask the question in the chat and then Kelly can answer it. <clears throat> Thank you, Brenda. If you can write it on the chat box, we would be grateful. The question is, what happens with very young children? Same thing. You can do the same things. It depends on how you want to go about it, but you can take classes, you can enroll them in classes to uh, socialize, you can enroll them, uh, you can use your respite hours to pay for other stuff like to do, uh, make a plan to achieve the goals that you have established. You know, the goals for young kids under 10 years old or younger than that. You can help them out. That's important as a mom. I'm helping Amelia to choose activities that are for her. I'm paying attention all the time in the things that she might be interested in. There's some things that she loves to do and I know. Not necessarily because she tells me, oh, mom, I love doing this or that. But her way of being when she's doing that thing and what catches her eye, those are the things that I use to reach the goals that we have in the uh, person-centered plan. For example, in Amelia's case, what we do We pay attention in the things that she loves to do. For example, she loves to play. It's called Just Dance. It's a video game on Nintendo. I don't even know the name in English or Spanish for this thing. It's a, it's a, it's a video game, right? She loves playing that. She loves to dance. She loves to remember the choreographies that they do and she loves to do all that so when we're thinking the things that might help to build the skills that she needs to partake in the community we're thinking in the things that she might be interested in we include them in the spending plan because they are related to the disability for example if we know that communication is something that she needs to practice, we want her partaking in classes with other people, people of all types, uh, with all the community, so that she can make new friends, hang out, 
spend time in the things that she has interest in. And not only therapy, of course, we have those, but playing, playing is therapy. It is extremely important to remember that when we are happy, we can learn even more. The important thing for my daughter is for her to have interest in the things she's doing, for her to want to be a part of the community. And when she's doing the things that she has interested in, we can see her improvement, the improvement in the other skills. For example, adaptative skills, exercises, participating in the community, and for the community to get to know her as well. Because it is important for this back and forth, for both parts to learn from each other. Another question, how do you determine, how can I determine if SDP is good for me? That is an excellent question, Alex Marcus, Marcus from Westside Regional Center. The best way of knowing if this is a good program for you would be to start with the process. If you love the process, if you find an independent facilitator and you find, I don't, I have not met anyone that disliked SDP after starting doing it. But if whatever whatever reason you don't want to continue with the program, you can always go back to the traditional system. If you go back to the traditional system, you have to wait for at least a whole year to go back to SDP if in the future you want to do it. I have several friends that have uh, transitioned. Everybody is happier with SDP than before with the traditional system. Everybody is either a Spanish speaker or bilingual, and that's important to bear in mind as well. It seems like we have another question. I, I had seen a raised hand, Christiana. I just wanted to say, I put some links in the chat that lists all of the options that you have um, that you could do in the self-determination program, um, just so it can give you some ideas of things that might be options. Um, look at both of them because one of them lists all the options and then the second one goes into a little bit more detail of um, for goods and services of what can and cannot be paid for. Thank you, Cristiana. That's very helpful. Do we have any more questions about the possibilities or should I continue with the presentation and see if as we go with the presentation that might answer some of the questions that folks might have? I'm going to move on then. If we don't have any other raised hands and what we can do if I don't answer the questions, we can continue with um, writing the questions in the chat box as I'm presenting. We have this uh, slide about the extra work. Is there more work? I'm not gonna lie. Yes, there is extra work, like work, more than the traditional system. But for me, it's worth it. For my family, it's worth it. We're happier with self-determination, even though it implies more work than in the traditional system. But we, we are parents of uh, kids with a disability and self-advocates uh, for their rights. And it's important to remember that we are already doing the work. In this case, it's work that is absolutely worth it. And for me, 
before all the work that I've done was not necessarily worth it. And so this difference is important to me. So we decide how to use the funds. And that gives us more flexibility and independence. But to be more specific, what type of extra work we have to do? We have responsibilities. You have to make calls to the FMS, the financial management system. When you have a question or to verify that the FMS has paid your employee or the organizations you hire to provide services, that is important because you are responsible. You have to search for the services you want to use to meet the disability-related goals in your person-centered plan. You have to search for the services. Of course, you will, you will receive assistance for it, but you need to search for it. You have to talk to the people or organizations you want to use to provide services and supports in the self-determination program. You have to make sure that they can be paid through SDP. When they're trying to receive payment, it is important that they know exactly how to go about it with the FMS. That is very important. It is different. It's not the same to be a vendor with the regional center. This is different. And they have to be a part of the program but through the FMS. They have to sign the paperwork, do all the onboarding, and that is somewhat different than providing services in the traditional system. You, as a participant, or as a circle of support to the participant, you have to certify and approve the personal hours through the electronic system that your FMS uses. Most FMSs have an app, and the app is where you approve the hours. It is not hard, but it's an extra responsibility. None of this is difficult, but it's work. You have to devote some time. You have to have a time available to do these, these tasks. I think there are people in FMS, uh, that, that they speak Spanish, if that's important to you, or if you have someone that can help you out with English, you have two options to solve the problems and what, when problems arise. Do we have any questions uh, regarding the extra responsibilities? the things that we are uh, responsible for. I don't know if Kira has seen questions in the chat. Hi, Kelly. Yes, there is a question in the chat from Alfredo. Are you able to open it? It's the most recent one, if you can see it. in Spanish, so I'm giving it to you. I have heard about everything that, uh, what as a parent, what we need to know and do if we want to work directly with the agencies that will provide services or working with the FMS in order to help us to set up services those are expenses that are used on services for the beneficiaries. So, Mr. Alfredo, uh, from what I see that you wrote there, I agree with you that we have to work directly with the agencies. They are the ones working with the participant in the program. I don't know if there is any more questions. Uh, 
I was letting the facilitator know Elena wanted to ask a question. <clears throat> Can you open Elena's uh, phone, uh, the phone line? I don't see her. I am unmuting her now. Thank you. Excuse me, good morning. My question was if you're going to share the PowerPoint that you are presenting right now. I will, of course, and I think that Kira can help us and share it on the chat. And we can, after we will share the recording on YouTube. Kindly. And I put links on the presentation because I thought that it would be easier once you open the presentation for you to click uh, on all the links. The presentation is already on the chat. Christiana. I just wanted to make sure that um, Alfredo knows you don't have to use vendored services when you're in the self-determination program. So um, while you can use them, the, the benefit is that when you get into self-determination, you can use anybody. Thanks so much. Kira, can you share uh, the PDF? Because I don't think the people that are not on a Mac computer, how to, they will not be able to download. We're going to show them right now how to save a document as a PDF. So maybe we can help them. Hi, Kelly. I have it as the downloadable and as a link. Everyone should be able to download the link, but I will go ahead and try and convert this into a PowerPoint and put that in there. So if one of those options doesn't work for you, just go ahead and click the next one because it can vary depending on computer. I think that after the presentation, we could share a PDF for those who are unable to open it. And if you cannot receive it, please uh, send us your email and we will send it to you afterwards. You could add your email address on the chat. you can send us an email directly if you're having problems with technology and I can help you. So we can send you this document. I think I see two more questions on the chat. I do not see them. Should I keep moving forward? Are we good? personal goals in the person center plant people talk a lot about goals I think that Christiana has a question uh it was Tim I'm sorry or Bo both of you have questions Lorna asked to make sure people know how to raise their hand um that uh, she wasn't sure people knew how to raise their hand I'm I'm going to stop sharing so I can let you know to in order to raise your hand if you go to the bottom of your screen if you're in a computer you're going to see something called reactions and under reactions you'll see there raise your hand and to lower your hand you click on that there 
we can practice. You can raise your hand. If you find reactions on your screen, then you are such good students. You know how to raise your hand. Once you, once you raise your hand, you also need to learn how to lower it because otherwise you're going to confuse the gringa all the time. So then you can lower your hand on the same area. So now everybody knows if you have questions. Uh, thank you for this reminder. Tim has a question or a comment. Go ahead. I don't use any traditional vendor services in my SDP, but I know people who has a combination of traditional vendor services like ABA therapy, and they also hire their own staff without a traditional agency. You can have both. Great point. Thank you, Tim. Mr. Alfredo. Yes, good morning. Thank you for this workshop. It is so important for us to know how we can put together the self-determination program. The comments I made, it was a comment, not a question. But I have a question precisely about that comment. As parents, how can we have a workshop where we are taught how to make the plan and we are the ones in charge of the expenses because what i hear is that it's complicated for us to know about taxes insurance what we are responsible for with employees or it with the agencies that we're going to hire so the fms If you can please provide us the meaning of the acronyms used, because honestly, I don't understand it. I would appreciate uh, that if we that could be clear what all these acronyms use, what they mean. That would be my request. Thank you so much. It's such a good and important question. I help families with the self-determination uh, program. I use the Disability Voices United uh, book in, Span uh, in Spanish is uh, Think Outside the Box. I'm gonna show you how it looks like. So you know what the acronyms mean. It's like you're learning another uh, language. It's not English or Spanish. That's what's hard for all of us. It's hard in English to learn all of this, even more so in Spanish, because you need to know everything, but in another language in other uh, words that other that people don't typically use. And if you give me a moment, I'm going to show you a picture of what the book looks like. And the book is already translated in Spanish. I don't know when you will receive it. That was this is a this is a special uh, gift that Tim is going to give a few participants. This is one of the book is one of the gifts for the raffle we're going to have at the end. And regarding about how we can learn what we need to do, what we need to know in order to be the employer for people and agencies that we're going to hire, whether it's insurance, workers comp. in the West Side Regional Center. But just so you know, your uh, advisory committee
I believe that they have independent facilitators that could help you with this. There are learning circles. Uh, each committee has a different way that they can spend the special funding they receive. They can use it for classes, for one-on-one -on -one support. If you think that it would be a, a good idea to have a class just about this, uh, for example, how workers' comp uh, works, all the... That's a really good question. All these acronyms that we have. We can bring the information. And right now we have with us Alex Marquez. And he can tell us about the type of presentations that they have done in the past and the type of things that they have coming up in the future in order to support people. Uh, would you like to uh, say something, Alex? Hi, good morning, everyone. I am Alex Marquez. Good morning, Kelly. Technically, my title is a specialist in uh, participant choice, but we are often called SDP specialists. I can put my email and phone number in the chat. And like Kelly mentioned, if we have trainings or any past training, all of that could be shared by email or any other communication uh, form we need in order to share information. Thank you so much, Alex. I think this is very helpful for the people who want to learn more in order to start with the program. And we need to know what, what to do with the program because we don't want to make mistakes but we also want to use the incredible programs we already have. I see that Miss Elena is waiting for the book. I am not sure when the book will be available in Spanish. I hope soon because it has list the list of responsibilities, the list of things that we as parents need to do. And it's a treasure. It's very important. I see that Kira added the link to the chat where you can find it. Kira had a question regarding the book. Kelly, yeah, I just wanted to let folks know about the book. We do have the Spanish version available on our website right now that you can purchase for our Think Outside the Box. If you are waiting on a copy because you, you attended our conference, please know that those are coming. It might take us around a month to get those out. We're a very small team. We're shipping them out as fast as we can. Um, if you have any questions or concerns about your book, I'm gonna leave my, my email in the chat so you can email me, but just know that nobody has received their Spanish book yet. We, we are starting to ship them out shortly. So those should be coming soon. I just wanted to say, if you're going to cover a little bit more about the role of the IF at the beginning of the services, because from what I understand, there are a lot of parents that see it, uh, they see that as very difficult. So I think it would be important to mention to parents that there is 
funding available from a regional center so that parents don't have to pay out of their own pocket to start with SDP. So they don't have to navigate everything on their own. They have somebody who can help them. And there are many facilitators who are bilingual so that people don't think that they have to do everything by themselves and do everything by themselves. Thank you. Excellent comment. Thank you so much. You are absolutely right. There are many facilitators, independent facilitators, they are bilingual, but we also have more information in the future regarding that as well. Okay, I'm going to move on. Here we are. Personal goals. We already touched on that. Let's remember that the goal drives the spending. Without goals, there is no need for funds. That is how we are going to establish the goals to meet the needs. And then we can use the supports and services you find with your independent facilitator or yourself. That way you can reach your goals. It is very important that we have goals in the person-centered plan, and that's going to help us tremendously in deciding how are we going to use the funds in the spending plan. Uh, here's the, the, the screenshot, the sample of the book cover in Spanish. This is what it looks like. It's uh, think creatively, think outside the box. And the next uh, pages you're going to see now are uh, a little bit from, from the book. We want to know what are differences between the traditional system and the new self-determination program. And everything is included in the book. But let's review the differences between the two. What ages are eligible and in the traditional system, all ages are eligible from birth throughout their whole life. And in self-determination, normally, we use this program from three years on, but you can do it before three years old if they are eligible to receive services according to the Lanterman Act not only early start, early intervention. That's a different thing. And if you don't qualify for the Lanterman Act, that is the difference between zero and three in the traditional system. Where should they receive the services? Well, in right now it should be... Uh, in anywhere in California, and they have to be services in the community. No matter where they live, they have to receive the services in the community. They can use SDP in less restrictive environments. If they foresee that the person will move into the community in within 90 days. What this means is that, or what it's important to bear in mind is that all services have to be in the community or in the house, in the home. It is important to remind that they have to be in settings. They cannot be in segregated, separate uh places that is very important because that is related with the HCBS rule HCBS rule that is the rule that uh, says that the uh, services have to be given in the community and the planning process well we're talking about a person-centered plan this helps us to create a uh, plan for the person, both 
programs have an IPP, an individual program that happens in both. But in self-determination, what we are going to do is we're going to make a plan, a people-centered plan, a person-centered plan, sorry, and then an IPP to handle the important goals in the self-determination. The IPP has to reflect the goals that we established by ourselves or with the assistance of our independent facilitator. This will be reflected in the IPP. Another question is like, how often do we need to plan out? Well, what we do it is yearly, but in both systems, the traditional or the SDP, what we can do is we can have meetings with our team as needed. If you want to work with the PCP, person-centered plan, it has to happen at least yearly, once a year. You have to uh, meet with the regional center folks. They have to do the IPP. They still need to do it. So you still need to meet with those folks once a year. Normally, when you are self-determined, what we need to do, we need to think about how are we going to use the goals, the person center plan, during the second year. We got to think ahead maybe two months before that year mark. We got to meet again with the independent facilitator, with the service coordinator and we gotta meet to make a plan to renew the budget the spending plan and all that jazz who decides what services and who gives those services well in the traditional system it's the regional center and the IPP team they do that together but in the self-determination program, the participants and or their families are the ones that decide which services and who gives those services. And this is related to the responsibilities I was telling you about earlier. What we're going to do, we're going to have the vision. We're going to set the goals, the desires, think, what are we going to do? In this case... We need to follow the rules to spend those funds. What Christiana shared earlier, a few moments ago, maybe a half hour ago, she was telling us the things in which we can spend the money in and the things we're not allowed. For example, we cannot spend the funds in food, for example. We cannot spend the funds in some things. And the regional center has the responsibility of uh, verifying that the funds are being used legally, properly. They will not allow us to use the funds in ways which are improper. But in many places, there are differences in the ways we verify or we accept or we uh, interpret the plan they verify and they find out if they can use it they're not approving how you do it they're looking for more information We got to find out 
how are we using it and making sure that we are using those funds in an acceptable way. In self-determination, who pays the bills? It's going to be the FMS, Financial Management Service. The consumer responsibility in SDP, in self-determination, is to attend an orientation. You can do it. We can assist virtually, create a plan or person-centered plan with a, a planner paid by the funds of the regional center. And the lady that spoke previously, she talked about that that there are funds to help you to transition into the system. And you can use them right now. When you are designing the spending plan, you need to have the information. You need to have the employees that you want to use, the organizations, the companies that you want to use. To reach your goals that you have established in the person-centered plan. It's, it implies a little bit of work to make sure that you have all those bases covered. But once you have all that, all that, you will have lots of independence and flexibility more than what you had in the past. Uh, the services, do, do they need to be vendorized? No. You just need to have a contract authorized by the FMS. They do not need to be vendorized with the regional center. That is very important to bear in mind. That is one of the most important differences um, between traditional and SDP. If you, if there is a class you want to attend and you want to partake in something in the community, if this organization has not done uh, the contract with the regional center, you can still use them. You can use them if both the organization, the company, and the FMS are in touch with each other, they can write a contract to provide those services. For your loved one and for yourself, if it's your own plan. Now, who looks for the service providers? Here we're talking about responsibility. In the traditional system, the regional center is the one looking for them. But in SDP, it's the participant, the family, the IF. They are the ones who can look for that. You can put on the chat, even right now, I'm looking for this or the other. This is in, in this is the search is our job the participant and his or her support circle are the ones looking for those support and this is under SDP. Now, who provides the oversight for quality in service uh, providing? It's in SDP, it's our role. It is our responsibility to check on the people who are providing the services that they're doing what they're saying they're going to do. And we are the ones who are to assess the quality of services. And if we don't like it, we need to let them go and keep on looking. For me, that is one of the good things of this program. Because when I want to change from one thing to the other, it takes time to get to the new thing. But the difference is that me and my daughter can choose where she can go, where she can take her swimming classes if she's going to have them 
in a group or if she cannot find a one-on-one -on -one provider, for example. We need to think of the things that will help us to reach the goal. So what type of services can be coordinated? It's got to be services approved by the federal government. So we cannot use funds in a way that do not comply with federal rules. So the one who can help us with this is the IF. Or you can send an email to poor Alex Marquez and see if it is something you can do. All of that can help us to determine whether you can do something or not. Remember, we still need to use generic resources. If we have access to private insurance or medical, we need to use that first. That is still the case. Uh, if you think, oh, how nice, uh, my child needs a speech therapist and we cannot do that because my insurance has a wait list. And yet the point is you still need to use generic resources first and you need to have a denial letter stating that the insurance does not cover this service. And only in that case, you can use the funding. But don't you worry. You, we still need to get the official denial letters from the district, from private insurance. And th this is still part of our job, you know, if we need to find, you get those denial letters from the district. But if it is an adult, you still need to get those denial letters. For example, you are, if you're under medical, you need the official denial letter. So on the one hand, this is making things easier, but there is still quite a bit of work to do. You can always appeal. You still have that right. If your rights uh, have not been upheld, remember civil rights ex still exist and you can still use the appeal system like you do in the traditional system. There might be questions in the chat. Is there any question in the chat that I need to look at? Yeah, I see there is a question. Kira? Um, yes, there is a question in the chat from Brenda. I also put it in our tracking document. Kelly, if you're able to take a look at that, it's just one question back after Alex's. It is in Spanish. So just one question. Yes, there's that one question from Brenda just above Alex, and that's the only one currently in the chat that has gone unanswered. The question is, if my child only qualifies for respite If the child only qualifies for respite hours at the regional center, can they still 
start with SDP. Yes, you can still start with SDP. In the past, you know, the cost of the FMS was deducted out of our own budget, but that is no longer the case. Now all the funding in our budget can be used, but in our case, perhaps your child qualifies for other things, maybe social skills or camps or recreation. Everyone has access to that type of uh, funding. Maybe you can ask your service coordinator. And if there are unmet needs, uh, needs that have not been tended to by the regional center, perhaps they're not in your IPP, individual program plan, And in that plan, you can see if there are other options. To make your budget a little bit bigger. Perhaps what we could do. Let's say that uh, the respite hours is $4,000 a year. Well, you could use the $4,000 for things that you actually need that meet the goals related to the disability, and you can use the funding in a different way. Perhaps you are very happy and you don't need anything else. Maybe you're already thinking ahead, and in the future, you will need to use the funding in a different way. And you will need to think what will be the adult life like for your child. That's another thing. But in your case, if you're thinking of respite hours, I don't know how many hours you have a month, but if, look at the total for a year and you can use that funding for something else. And I know people with, uh, with budgets of 3,000, 13,000, 30,000. Everyone has specific needs. I'm happy I don't need to have such a big budget because that means we don't need as much. Life is hard for us already. I don't want it to be harder. In our case, if we had our life the way we want it, what could we do with that same funding in order to meet those goals? You could do two things at a time. For example, let's say if your child takes uh, dance lessons, then you can put a respite because you have actual rest. It is important to, to have that time to rest. That is so important. We work all the time. But what we can do is rest while our child is in the dance lesson, while they are in another class. So the funding is doing two things at the same time. instead of just applying the rules of respite that they need to be at home, that they can only see my child with a disability, they're unable to do anything else. Instead of that, you could do something a little more flexible, something that is maybe, a, that is less difficult. And you can start with respite and in the future, you're thinking, what else do we need? If there is a service or support in the traditional system, that can help you to increase the funding in years to come. If it's something that does not exist in the traditional system, they are not going to add funding to your SDP budget. 
for example, if you need help with adaptive skills, with communication, for example, perhaps they just need practice. They don't need uh, speech therapy. They need practice talking to people. Maybe you can look for a coach, somebody that can help you uh, in taking turns when they're having a conversation. That's an adaptive skill. And you can use your funding for that. I don't know if that was too long for an answer, but I hope that was helpful. Even if you have a, a small budget, you can still benefit from SDP. Each year, you can think of the needs related to the disability. And then you can search for the funding for these uh, unmet needs or the changing circumstances. Because changing circumstances are quite important. For example, when my daughter graduates high school, she's going to have a different life than what she has right now. In, if she goes into medical, that's a change in circumstances. This is important to keep in mind when talking to the service coordinator. And it is hard for us because we don't want everybody to know our life. But in my case, I need to be, I need to feel comfortable revealing information because I won't get help unless I do so. I don't have the privacy I would want. I want to keep my family protected. I don't want to share everything with an outside organization, with anybody. I would like to keep all that private. But in my, I don't have the same privacy that my neighbors have that have a daughter without a disability. I don't have that option. I will not be able to get help unless I reveal the challenges I have with my daughter. Christiana, go ahead. We know there is significant disparity with our community and that our community tends to have very low purchase of service. We don't get a lot of access to services. And I say our because I am half Mexican and I come from this community as well, even though my Spanish is terrible. I apologize. <laughs> Um, uh, so know that the budget, it's not unusual for people to have very low or no budgets when they start this process, uh, because we do come from communities that are underserved. So when we started with my son, it, we started with $200. The budget is a negotiation. It starts with what was spent in the last 12 months, but it will be based on your needs, and that includes unmet needs. And this is where a really good independent facilitator is going to help you and have a very strong person-centered plan to be able to identify those needs so we can get those things um, added to your budget. Also, there was a question that was sent directly to me. I thought I would read if that's okay, Kelly. Uh, it was from Mayoria, Ma Mariora, and it said, services based on needs, a individualized tailored day program provided by a non-vendor of RC, Regional Center, are only available in self-determination program, or should they be provided and funded through the traditional program regardless? Kelly, do you want to answer that? Can you read it? I was listening in English, but with the Spanish on top of it. Where was that? Was that written in English or in Spanish? 
It was sent to me directly. I was hearing both at the same time and my brain did not really fully catch uh, it. Uh, let me try to answer. Um, if you have tailored day program in the traditional system, they will use vendored services in your tailored day. If you are in the self-determination program, it won't necessarily be called tailored day because all of self-determination is creating that specialized services. So you can pick and choose similar to Taylor Day in the traditional system, but you are not in both at the same time. You're either in the traditional system or Taylor Day, or uh, sorry, or self-determination program. So um, I hope that answers the question. Um, raise your hand if I did not answer it correctly. It seems like you answered very well. I have to go back and forth. I have to toggle back and forth. Thank you for everybody's patience. Tim, what's, what's Tim's comment or question? I see he has his hand up. Kelly, remember, since your daughter is in charge of her own life, and as she gets older and decides for herself, your daughter may not want you to be a part of her self-determination. I know it's scary as a parent, but think of it as your daughter mature into a young adult. She will make her own choices and may not want her mom in her program. Self-determination is meant for the individual and their hopes and dreams and how they want to achieve it. My parents always gave me choices in my life to help me shape the person that I am now. And I'm constantly making decisions on a bone and always learning from my mistakes. I still ask my parents for their advice, but they don't run my life like any able-bodied person would. Thank you, Tim. You make an excellent point. And thank you for reminding me that someday she will tell me she doesn't want me anymore and she's going to make her own life. And I don't know how to say thank I I, I, I cannot put in words how, how grateful I am. Mariora, what type of question do you have? Uh Yes. Hold on. Uh, can you hear me now? Okay. So my, my issue is that at the time, let's say uh, three years ago, my daughter participated in a tailored day program that I funded privately because my regional center did not have what we call today a tailored day program. I am requesting before I enter in the self-determination, I am requesting retroactive reimbursement. If they did not offer the program then, um, you probably will not get retroactive reimbursement um, because it just wasn't available through the regional center. But now that it is available, um, you they should be able to put it into your budget. I mean, you can ask, and there's nothing, there's no harm in in um, using your fair hearing uh, rights. Those are your rights. But uh, that that was kind of my my comment on it thank you i appreciate it thank you very much i know that we only have eight minutes left 
and I have tons of other information that I'd like to share with you. And I am not sure exactly how we're going to fit it in. Maybe in the future, we can do this again. I know that we had, I don't know how Tim is going to do the raffle organized by Tim, Tim Jin. It seems like what we need to do now is talk a little bit more about um, IFs, independent facilitators. And after that, with the questions that you ask, we're going to pick three participants. <laughs> and we have uh, immigration status as well. So we have two more slides that we need to discuss. And after that, Tim is going to raffle uh, a prize, a very interesting prize. I hope you find it interesting too. Uh, immigration status. That is a question that a lot of folks have about self-determination and immigration status. Regional centers provide services regardless immigration status. This is the same in SDP. It has nothing to do with this. And people employed through SDP must have legal working status in the US, including a work permit, green card or US citizenship because it is a federal program. The undocumented SDP participants are not eligible for some generic resources like SSI. This means that some folks might eligible for rental subsidies outside the SDP budget. I am not an expert in this topic. You need to talk to your uh, service coordinator and the resources in your community. I, I don't want to uh, misguide you because I'm not an expert. Independent facilitators. It is important to look for someone that can help you out in the things that you think you might need help with. Some important questions that I recommend that you ask your uh, facilitator. Do you help participants after they transition into self-determination program? For example, some folks are only there to help you with the person center plan and maybe to navigate the system, help you make the transition, enter the SDP, the self-determination. Some other facilitators will help you even after you enter the program. You have to know which one of those two you need and you got to find someone that will help you after the transition if that's what you need. Also, you have to ask them. If you prefer someone that only that speaks Spanish, you got to find someone who is bilingual. It is important. How much do you charge? What is your rate? Is it hourly, monthly, or something else? I've heard I've heard recently that some facilitators, independent facilitators that are billing for each email, text message. And if this is the way in which you bill, you need to know that. That is how they're going to go about it because you don't want to end up paying more money uh, from your budget more than it's necessary. It is in, This is part of your responsibility that we have. We have to be responsible. We don't want to spend the funds in things that are not directly useful for the participants. I have a IF for my daughter, even though I help another family. I pay for her when I need her on an as-needed basis. It's not like she bills me once a month. 
I do not worry about the funds. Most of the things I know a lot about this program, I can do it for myself, but every year I learn more and more. In this case, it is very important to know the type of help or the type of assistance you think you might need. And after that, when you continue, you got to know how, how to learn to lower the total that you pay each year for the future. We need the supports that we need. That's important. But if we are doing the legwork, we don't need to pay someone else to do that. It's very important to learn how the program works and to lower the total that we pay for that type of service. It is, you know, a personal goal for myself or for some parents that are helping out their uh, children. I don't want to spend funds in things that don't benefit directly my daughter if I don't have to. I want all the funds to go to fulfill her needs. And I hope you agree with this philosophy as well. Do we have any questions? Sadly, I have a lot more to share, but we can't do that today. Maybe we can talk more in the future, but also I want to know if we have any other questions right this moment about any uh, part of my presentation. Kelly, I apologize, but our translators must go on time and it's we have one more minute, unfortunately. Um, one more question, uh, Kira, or, you know, the raffle. Yeah, Kelly, Lorna um, and Annabella can stay. Let's let's keep it a max of five more minutes. So um, I don't think we have any more questions. <laughs> Maybe that you can respond to and then we can go to Tim's raffle. Um, I'm going to read the question in English. It was originally asked by Marciela in Spanish. Um, and that question or that comment is, I would like to enter the self-determination program, but I'm holding back because I don't know where I can find the agencies that can provide the services my son needs. It's a great question, Marcela, because the, what you can do is join us on June 10th at uh, the Westside Regional Center the, this will not be at the Westside Regional Center offices, but it will be at the uh, Veterans Memorial Building. I don't have the exact address, but it's on the flyer. But we're going to have a resource fair that day. And that's where you can find agencies, organizations, providers, whatever name you want to give it. And you can get to know them. And maybe you can find an IF. maybe you can find services that day we're going to start at 10 a.m we're going to be there 10 to 1 we we're waiting for you there i think that would be a really good idea to add it to your calendar today june 10th we can see each other then this is last one and then tim be ready with the raffle tim okay Yes, my question is about the research fair that you mentioned, Kelly, that will be on June 10th, 10 a.m. It, it will be in person, right? What is the location? I'm going to share the information on screen because it was at the beginning when we were uh, starting, so maybe you didn't see it then. Let me share it on screen again. while we finish.
It is on the building called Veterans Memorial Building and Tent Center. And it's going to be at the VMB Rotunda Room. The address is 4117 Overland Avenue, Culver City, California, 90230. Thank you. I took a picture. I will definitely be there that day. Thank you so oh. much. What's up, Tim? For the raffle, we have three prizes that you can win. Think outside of the box in Spanish or our other book, Profile in Self-Determination, or you can win both books. Kelly, let's ask a question of what we learned today and choose three lucky winners so I can spin the wheel for each of them. The, our first winner is Alfredo Aguera because he made such a good question that made me think. Thank you. Tim. Mr. Alfredo, if you could give your email address to Kira. Kira, I don't know how you would want to handle this, but Kira can help you with this. The next winner is Brenda. Brenda Veronica. Tim, go ahead. Very good. Thank you. And the last one will be Elena. <laughs> She's the grand prize winner. Thank you so much. Thank you for being with us this morning. Thank you so much for your patience. So I'm just going to wrap it up now. Thank you so much for being here today.